one of the big lessons that kind of Europe is teaching us and that kind of American is having trouble with realizing is Europeans like to keep the hemp small, you know, under sort of 10, 11 feet, you know, 12 feet at max. You know, they like sort of eight foot, nine foot plants because they're workable and the machines can, can harvest things a little bit easier when you have a 10 foot plant compared to a 14 or 15 foot plant. That's Corbett Metiff from Konopi US. This is the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. My name is Eric Herlock. Today I will be talking to Corbett and his colleague Robin Destish from Konopi US, a company that specializes in European hemp seeds. We'll hear about the company, how they got started, why they focus on European genetics. We'll talk about the European hemp industry and what we as Americans can learn from the Europeans. We'll also talk about the Farm Bill, Certified Seed, and what Shiva may reveal to you while walking down the Himalayan path. There's so much in this interview today, I think you'll really enjoy it. So we will take a quick sponsor break, and then I'll come back with a couple of updates, and we'll get into my conversation with Corbett and Robin from Konopi U.S. This episode is brought to you in part by M Pactful Ventures, an investment and incubation company focused on supporting startups and other initiatives that play a vital role in mitigating the adverse effects of climate change. At Impactful Ventures, they strive to amplify enterprises that bring innovative green opportunities to the forefront and empower those making a significant impact for a sustainable future. You can learn more at mpactfulventures.org. Today's show is sponsored by IND Hemp in Fort Benton, Montana, where they believe in the goodness of hemp. So just the other day, I was talking to Ken Elliott from IND Hemp, and he was wondering if we could use this sponsor message here on the show to urge all of our listeners to go see the movie Common Ground. This is the sequel to Kiss the Ground that came out a few years ago. Common Ground is premiering around the country this month, and Ken really wants all of us to go see it. He says, and I quote, Regenerative farming is a big part of the environmental solution, and hemp is regenerative farming. They is us, and we is them, he says. I'll put a link to the Common Ground website on the show page for this episode, and you can see when it's coming to your neck of the woods. Okay, welcome back. Before we get into my interview with the guys from Kona PUS, I wanted to just fill you in with a couple of things that were happening here, hemp-wise, this this past week. Uh, This past week being, what, the first week of November? First full week of November. Yeah. So anyway, earlier this week, I was interviewed by Dr. Ron Kander and grad student Gabriella Firavante from Jefferson University, putting together an industrial hemp introductory course at Jefferson. And they asked me to, you know, sit for some questions. So it was really fun to be on the receiving end of an interview. Um, And if I can share that link with you, I will, but I'm still waiting to hear back on permissions. Uh, but if you're interested in hearing, hearing what I have to say about the state of the industry and uh, my experiences in the hemp space, um, you can go to the show page for this episode at LancasterFarming.com. And it might be there. Uh, the other thing uh, that happened, it was actually last week, but we had our very first in-person podcast studio guest here. Um, it was Cameron McIntosh who stopped by the studio and we talked about the, the, the hempcrete sound panels that are hanging on my walls here. You can't see them, but trust me, they're still there. Um, there is a video of that interview. Um, it's going to be on YouTube. Hopefully I will get that published uh, today or tomorrow. So go check that out. It's a it's my first like video podcast, right? You see us the whole time. We've got the headphones and the microphones. So let's just listen to the first couple of minutes of it and hopefully it will entice you to go seek it out and, and enjoy the entire, entire video. Cameron McIntosh, welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast Studio for our first ever 
in-person interview. Live and in-person here from uh, 21 West Main in Ephrata. Yeah. About 20 minutes from where I grew up. It's pretty cool. Oh, yeah? Nice to be here, yeah. Yeah, well, yep. welcome back. <laughs> welcome back. Um, so I thought you would be the perfect first guest here because of these panels that we made together. We made hempcrete sound panels. Um, so yeah, I don't know what to do here because I've never done an in-person interview, but uh, yeah, so I don't know if the folks listening can see it as well because there is a video component. We are we're shooting video here today. Um, it's not quite Joe Rogan, but... Hey, it feels like it though, man. Does it? Look at us. Yeah. Look at us, yeah. man. <laughs> Headphones, microphones, comfortable chairs. That's right. A little um, bit of hemp in the studio. Some hemp in the studio. Let's talk about that. Can you... Uh, Maybe first describe to me what I was trying to do when I came to you with this project. You want me to describe yeah. what you yes. wanted to do? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, with your, your new office here, you were noticing what a little bit of ugly sound reflection yeah, some bounce, for, bounce in the room. for recording. And now that we're, I would say, firmly post COVID, uh, you needed to come back to the office. <laughs> <laughs> time to get out of the house. So yeah, they enticed me by giving me this studio. They're right. like, Eric, come back and you right. can have a podcast studio. Right. <laughs> Which yeah, it works. Here I am. High quality yeah. corner office with a view. <laughs> well, it's got a view of a little alley, but yeah, it's, it's a, still it's a, a view. I got windows. It's still a view. I got a door. Yeah. So yeah, we were just trying to take advantage of the, you know, what is basically at this point anecdotal evidence around the sound deadening, sound absorption qualities of the material, right? So, uh, and this is something that at the beginning of my career making, you know, planner boxes, that was one of the first things I tried to do and why. Well, the thought was that, you know, maybe people didn't have to go through the the financial pain of doing their entire house out of hempcrete, let's think about ways that we can get hempcrete into the space, you know, and little by little, little by little. Yeah. Right. And get a little bit of some of those great qualities. Like in this case, the sound absorption, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of, uh, humidity balancing and, you yeah. know, air purification. So, you know, again, a lot of that stuff right now is anecdotal in hempcrete. I can tell you as a matter of experience, just from finishing houses that, you know, there is sort of a, spiritual quality when you walk into a hempcrete house that's finished and i think a lot of that comes from that mass feeling of having this material in the space and also what it does sound quality wise it makes it feel right. like your voice is you know right here by your head yeah. you know so yeah. it's really it's really cool yeah so the interview is almost an hour and we talk about a lot of things um Cameron talks about a lot of the hempcrete projects he's worked on this past year, um, especially the project at the Lower Sioux Indian Reservation in Minnesota. Um, so it's really just neat to hear him talk about these projects uh, and a whole lot more. So please go check out the video on YouTube and who knows, it might become a, a full episode here on the podcast, but without the video component. Anyway, that's what's been happening here uh, in my life, hemp-wise, lately. So let's just start the show now, okay? All right, here we go. We're going to talk to the guys from Konopi, U.S. Corbett Mitef and Robin Destish from Konopi, U.S. Welcome to the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast. How are you guys doing? Really good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, it's great to be here, Eric. Thanks so much for having us on today. Absolutely. So let's start with some short introductions. Uh, Robin, introduce yourself, please. Yeah, so my name's Robin Destish. Um, I work with my partners here at Konopi, U.S. I'm based in Virginia, uh, originally from California, um, kind of looked at the hemp landscape about six years ago um found a lot of cannabinoids but no fiber and grain so i i went on a bit of adventure trying to learn more about fiber and grain um and i'll share a bit of that story with you guys today yeah we'll get into that uh corbett introduce yourself for us sure uh corbett Mitiff. a lot of my friends and uh, family call me corby uh and uh, i was born and raised in in texas but now reside uh in in tennessee 
uh, back in the early days, pre-2018 Farm Bill, Texas, they didn't want anything to do with hemp. So I sort of uh, I left Texas and moved to Tennessee, where all my heroes uh, were from. So I'm in Tennessee now, about an hour uh, due west of Nashville. Okay, well, welcome to you both. Um, let's first talk about what Konope US is. So who wants to start? Tell me, tell me about it. Uh, well, I'll, I'll start since uh, Robin wasn't quick enough. Um, we started Konope <laughs> US uh, two, two years ago. Um, it's, it's, a, it's kind of a conglomerate of, of three other companies. Uh, before Konope US, uh, I have uh, uh, started Hemp Seed Warehouse back in late 2016 when I was living in Europe. And uh, Konopi U.S. kind of merged. Uh, there was another company, Hemp Point USA, that Hannah was uh, and Robin were working with. And there were just sort of two companies uh, that were uh, mainly uh, distributing and advertising and, and working with French uh, hemp seed genetics. And so uh, Hannah and I and uh, the rest of the group decided to uh, kind of uh, quit working against one another and, and try to make the... Uh, hemp industry successful. So we, uh, we uh, became partners and started Konopi US. Okay. Robin, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. Um, as Corbett alluded to, um, we were all working with the same commodity coming out of Europe into a, a fledgling US industry. Um, we've got a better sense of that industry now. And I think we've all realized in our, our partnership, which Corbett and myself also includes Bert James and Hannah Gabrielova, who's in Europe. And uh, it became very apparent that working together is clearly more advantageous than working apart. So we combined our efforts a couple of years ago, um, and we're we're hoping to continue supporting the industry's growth with, um, you know, good, reliable genetics and some knowledge that goes with the farming. Okay. So yeah, you're essentially a, a, a seed company. You import the seeds, you help farmers get set up here, you provide what ag agronomy support. And, you know, tell me more about how, how you work with customers, how you work with farmers, how you work with the industry. Uh, the industry is quite small, um, feels very insulated sometimes. And so everybody has a sense of what's going on nationally and who's doing what and where. And, you know, Kudos to our industry. I think it's been a lot of open door and sharing and knowledge transfer. So, you know, we were already involved with going to, to conferences and university events and this sort of thing. Um, and that's where I would say we've we found the majority of our, our farming partners in this endeavor is, um, you know, getting out there to the farms, seeing what kind of equipment's out there, um, what's the lay of the land, so to speak, uh, the environmental factors involved in farming all over this country. Um, so it's it's still a small network, um, which is nice because it affords us opportunity to to give people time and really get in depth about what are the needs and, and what are you farming for? Um, as I'm sure you're well aware, um, it's very dependent on on who might that offtake be with. Right. And also just kind of add with a bit, a uh, few more details that we work a lot of different uni universities and we've been trialing a lot of different varieties and a lot of different locations. And so one of the things we like to do is make sure the farmer is successful by picking the right genetic that's going to work in his or her location uh, and then making sure it grows and there's a buyer for that. And so, you know, not only do we try to sell that seed, but we also make sure that the farmer's successful and has a successful grow and sells his crop and, and makes a profit because at the end of the day if, if the farmer isn't successful then we're really not successful right so, so that's the way we try to work good so you're not just dropping seed off in in may and see you later no you're there no, with the farmer no. throughout the whole process oh we have to be yeah we we sort of try to um you know visit you know each each of our customers you know a few times a year at, at least you know we like to be Kind of boots on the ground, as they say, and 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 go out there and see the field, and inspect the field, inspect it, and, and make sure that it's uh, it's looking like it should. Okay, and you're working with farmers throughout the United States. I mean, what what regions are you in, and uh, you know what what are you growing? Or yeah, what are they we've, growing? <laughs> yeah, we've um we've got partners all throughout the U.S. I think we've had seed in around thirty states now in the last two years. Um, some states grow better than others. You know, we do work with European genetics and their home latitude is a bit more north 
Um, so, you know, we have found a lot of success operating, you know, 37, 38 north. As you start to go further south, the days get shorter. It's a very photosensitive plant. Um, and we've done some southerly trials and, you know, sometimes they go okay, sometimes they don't. Um, but when we do the northern trials, things go quite well. Um, we, we have seen that firsthand time and time again. So we spend a, a good portion of our time working in the northern latitudes um, because, as Corbett mentioned, you know, that we need the farmers to be successful. So we're, we're quite honest and, and transparent about what's been working and where and we'll share whatever best practices we've picked up along the way. But you don't want to give somebody a genetic that's not going to be successful. Um, and quite quite often, you know, we might hear from somebody, I want to grow 500 acres or something like this. And it's, well, have you have you trialed it? Have you gone for five acres or 10 acres first? Um, or is it, you know, shooting for the moon? Uh, right out of the gates, which is a very challenging thing to do. We're talking about genetics, but then there's also the harvesting and the processing, which is a whole nother can of worms. Right. You know, a lot of the varieties, you know, they do ask us how to harvest them because different varieties have, have some different requirements. And so, you know, we do kind of match up kind of some of the equipment. We kind of try to mirror a lot of what the Europeans are doing. We try not to sort of reinvent things too much. All the American sort of ingenuity they we like to do things a little bit sort of differently but you know we try to replicate and you know try to do what they're doing in, in Europe try to try to do it here and, and we do kind of you know introduce some farmers uh to uh equipment sellers uh you know with some of the the Euro European equipment you know we try to get some of that over here and we can talk a little bit about that more later okay well yeah you um Europe is just seems to be further along than us right because they They've been growing hemp a little, a little longer than us. Mm. What are some of like the the main lessons that the U.S. industry can learn from Europe? I think that the approach is uh, conservative, slow and low, so to say. Um, that's the 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 nature of the business development in Europe, in my opinion. Um, they don't want to overdo it, shall we say, out of the gates. Um, it took them a number of years in Europe to uh, decades, really, to develop the amount of processors that they have now. And the U.S. is probably going to have double the amount of processors, you know, next year, it seems to be. So um, I take the slow approach. Um, we're still working out farm bill language. We don't even know where we're going to land it next year. Um so, you know, I, I would say the conservative approach, you know, don't overproduce, produce enough that you need um, and make sure you have some buyers in place before you ever plant. Right. I think one of the big lessons that kind of Europe is teaching us and that kind of American is having trouble with realizing is Europeans like to keep the hemp small, you know, under sort of 10, 11 feet, you know, 12 feet at max, you know, they like sort of eight foot, nine foot plants because they're workable and the machines can can harvest things a little bit easier when you have a 10 foot plant compared to a 14 or 15 foot plant. And so the Europeans are, are I think a little bit uh, smaller scale and, and Americans have a, a larger outlook towards things. Um, and, uh, and we're reinventing, you know, equipment for that to handle these larger sort of plants and things and these larger acreage. Um, but, uh, but that's just sort of, I think one example that sort of, uh, America's is kind of trying to learn something, uh, but having a difficult time learning right. from, from European styles. Is that something that we should consider? Like maybe not trying to grow the, you know, the 15 foot plants and maybe should try to keep it smaller. And is that a genetic thing or is that a harvest time thing? From my perspective, it depends on the processors. Yes. So we have some processors built in North America. Um, we've had some lines imported from Europe. We have a cotton industry here in the U.S. that has very large cotton gins available. Um, we have people who are engineers and have put together their own lines. The line itself will necessitate the input, whether you need two foot fiber or silaged fiber or your machine is a chopper or a mill of some kind and you could put a 15 foot piece of straw in there. 
Um, so I believe the machines dictate a bit of what that input material needs to be. It's also going to dictate what the output material is going to be. And so you have to match the input material to the processing line to the output material. And I think we're going about those in different ways, in different areas, which is entirely okay. That's a bit of a learning curve. Um, and I would also segue back to your last question um, about um, the difference between Europe and America. I would say the most sharp contrast is the size of farms we have in the States are significantly larger. We just have more farmland. So it gives farmers access to grow more large, more quickly. Um, but that will also necessitate bringing in more harvesting, more baling, uh, more turning machines. And those costs can add up very quickly when you consider how much acreage one of those machines can do. Um, so I'll, I'll pick it over to Corbett to answer the question uh, regarding genetics and time of harvesting. Uh, yeah, let's let can we sorry, can we repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned like in Europe, uh, they don't grow um, hemp plants as tall as we sort of want to here. Now, I'm curious if that is genetics, like do those genetics only grow a certain height? Or is it a, a harvest time thing where like they get to eight foot and they chop it? Yeah, I de it's definitely in ge the genetics. You know, we're realizing there's some sort of early and, and medium and late varieties. A lot of the Asian varieties, I think, would be kind of considered your late varieties. You know, we're not seeing those flower until November. And so they keep on increasing in, in size. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the French, you know, we're dealing with sort of early and, and medium varieties that, you know, 90 days, you know, uh, we'll start getting some flowers and you know, hundred days. I mean, they're really when you sort of get down to the to the nitty gritty of it. Uh, the 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 European genetics are um, uh, uh, bred in a in a way to sort of keep the size down and to sort of keep the 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 stalk uh, sort of like a long slender stalk. One of the main things that I've seen in the, the genetics between some of the Europeans and some of the Asian varieties that the Europeans have kind of created like a very little stem kind of on the bottom two thirds. You don't really see it branching out until you get to the top third of that, where uh, some of the, the Asian varieties, uh, they branch out uh, quite a bit. And, 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 and the Europeans realize that they just want one long strand of fiber and, and not much branching. And so um, they sort of kind of keep them within sort of a certain size. I, I think that, um, uh, that they they do you know try to restrict some of the heights, and I think that just goes back between some of the the, the flowering times of these plants. Right. Okay. Um, now, you, have you both spent considerable time in Europe? So I, I've lived there for almost twelve years, uh, off and on. I think Robin was there uh, for about four three years. Okay. Um, well, let's and, yeah, let's dig into that. So first, um, Corbett, tell me. Well, actually, let's. Go to the origin story. How did you get involved in hemp in the first place? So I just got with hemp at the kind of the right time at, at the right place, really. I was um, I come from sort of a, a family background that does international business. So shipping items and commodities and containers, you know, that was sort of just daily talk at our dinner table. Uh, something my, my dad's done since I can remember as a kid, uh, sort of international shipping and just find out what one country needs and what another country has and just kind of connect the dots. And so I was over in, in, in Europe. I was actually in education. I was teaching at a university. Uh, I, I come from a, 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 a media background. And so I do okay. sort of animation and photography and, and film. Oh, cool. So is that and, what you were teaching and, and where were you based? What I was teaching at University of Cardiff in Wales. And uh, one of my uh, good friends was uh, studying a PhD and was doing uh, eco housing um, and was sort of uh, they were building houses with him over in Europe. And so I, I was just amazed by it and um, knew that it was kind of coming to America at one point. And um, I just found myself in a situation one day. I'm like, I, I got to find some the best European seed and get it to America because I heard all this talk where uh, America was gonna you know, pass this 2018 farm bill and, and they were gonna grow all this hemp. And my first thought is where are they gonna get all that seed? You know, cause that's where it starts. And, and so uh, I, uh, 
I had a French uh, girlfriend uh, and uh, who was sort of Italian French, and we started just calling around to Europe uh, to the breeders and was trying to figure out who would sort of wanted to do some business. And the French, um, after a few calls, uh, finally opened their doors to us and um, uh, uh, just looked at their program. Uh, and they were quite transparent in a lot of ways. And uh, I saw a lot of their propagation fields and, and saw what they were doing and did a bit of research and found out that the French hemp history is, is quite amazing and goes back a long time. We can go into some of the French history uh, in a, uh, later uh, in this conversation, but I just knew uh, back in late 2016, I knew American uh, America was going to have to uh, need some hemp seed, and I, um, I was ready to move back to America. I'd been living in Europe, like I said, for 12 years, and so um, I moved back to America and uh, started this business. Okay. Um, Robin, let's hear your, your origin story. Yeah, sure thing. So I, uh, I found industrial hemp when I was in the Himalayas back in 2018. Um, it was growing all over the mountainside and I had just kind of this, you know, shall we say awakening moment, um, where, uh, you know, I had found this wild cannabis plant. It was much bigger than anything I'd ever seen. I said, you know, what is this for, guys? And he says, this is Shiva's plant. You know, Shiva brought this plant down to earth. Um, and this is why you'll see uh, 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 pictographs and depictions of Shiva up in the mountains with the cannabis leaf in the background. Um, and so I did some research after that moment and realized that, wow, this, this hemp has a very long history. So when I came back to the States in 2018, um, I started nosing around. I was in San Diego at the time where I'm from. Um, and I found a hemp industry association conference in LA. I went up there and got to meet lots of great people. Uh, but there really wasn't much on fiber and grain. It, it was nothing about these big, tall plants. And at the time, there wasn't a whole lot going on <clears throat> from where I was positioned, at least. Um, I knew that there was uh, Chris Boucher out in the Imperial Valley in San Diego um, doing his thing. He's been doing that for decades. Um, but it wasn't something I had access to. So, um, you know, I bounced around the U.S. a little bit looking for opportunities in 2018. Um, you know, I didn't find much in fiber and grain. I ended up out in Denver. Um, I ended up in Oregon, you know, and I just didn't fi find it, right? Maybe I wasn't looking in the right places. Um, during those travels, I had met Hannah over in Europe. Um, so uh, in 2020, uh, I moved to Europe and I went to work with Hannah over in Europe for a few years. Um, and then uh, had an opportunity to learn, you know, quite a bit more about, you know, the dynamics of hemp as it's seen across the pond. Um which, you know, kind of made me look at our own industry in the U.S. and say, gee, like this hemp really does have an opportunity. We're, we're quite a small market, but we have access to farmland. We have access to technology. Um, we have many universities in the U.S. engaged with hemp currently, um, far more than, than I have found anywhere else. So I think that we have a real a real opportunity to do something special here in the U.S. And, um, you know, I moved back to Virginia in uh, June earlier this year. And so I'm U.S. based now off the East Coast and I continuing with the hemp adventure. All right. So a couple of questions there, too. Um, where in Europe were you based? I was in Czech Republic. OK. Um, but we were doing work with partners in, you know, Poland, France, Germany, Hungary, Italy, um, you know, and each of these countries kind of has their own perspective on hemp and what that looks like for them. Right. Okay. And then you mentioned the Himalayas. Like I picture you were just like walking down a mountain path and you see this <laughs> giant uh, wild uh, cannabis plant. Um, first, I mean, if it's not too personal, why were you in the Himalayas? Yeah, so I was in Spain before that, and um, I met people who were doing quite a bit of hiking in the Andalusian region on the mountains and the coast. And um, one of the guys that we were hiking with had been, he's hes from the UK, he's British, and so he's been to India many times. And uh, he was always talking about, 
you know, it's a, it's a great place. If you're into adventure, if you like hiking, um, you should consider that. Um, and then, you know, I had gone to Italy after Spain and I had met some other folks who had been to India and I said, how did you like it? And they said, well, I really liked it. Um, they weren't on the trekking thing I was going to do. Um, but it was the signs had all said, you know, go adventure through India. So uh, I had gone to India. I did some volunteer work at a school for a month. And then I took one month and I just went trekking around um, with some friends that I had met there. Uh, one was a yogi. Um, another one was probably equated to like a Sherpa. Um, so they were they were avid outdoorsmen. And so we were going on these just incredible adventures up and down the mountains, like literally every day for a month. And it was on one of those times coming down where we had walked into this kind of field. And for them, it was like, yeah, it's just, what do you want to do? It's God's plant. It's everywhere. Um, but for me, I was like, whoa, this is mind blowing. What is going on here? Um, so it was a real game changer. Because God's plant had been illegal in your home country for 80 years. Yeah, exactly. And it's an unfortunate situation with India and Nepal. Um, you know, it hemp is all over the Himalayas on the Chinese side, on the Indian and the Nepali side. Um, and they have so much interest in doing something with it. And, you know, whether you're on the side of the argument that says it's from China or it's from somewhere else, it's all over the Himalayas. And so the Indian culture and, and the Nepali culture say, you know, this is part of our culture as well. Um, but unfortunately, you know, it's a very difficult plant to work with there due to its black market ties and a lack of regulation. Um, we have interest every year from people in those countries. Um, shout out to uh, Shaw Hemp Innovations out there in Nepal. They have a building seminar coming up soon. Diraj and Nivedita are working hard to make things happen in Nepal. Um, but it's a, it's a more challenging regulatory framework than we have even here. So um, I really hope their programs take off sometime in the future because they have, um, you know, they have very good genetics out there in the mountains still. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not like we, we, we want a thriving U.S. hemp industry, but we want a global, a thriving global hemp industry. Um, can you tell me a little bit about Shiva? Just like a little background. Shiva is... Uh, one of the Indian deities, um, you have, uh, gosh, there's, there's so many, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the big three of Shiva, Brahma, and I think Krishna, Vishnu, 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 Vishnu. Vishnu. Okay. um, and they're all, they're all worshipped differently and in different perspectives. And in the Indian culture, these deities personify, you know, on some level, human characteristics and traits, um, more people I find are understanding of Ganesha and Ganesha's personification of, um, you know, like good fortune or goodwill, something like this. Um, so, you know, to have kind of one of these, one of these deities with a cannabis leaf, um, as I found it, at least, I'm not saying this is how it is for everybody, but where I was in the mountains, this was the reality of it. Mm -hmm. Um, it was uh, 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 it's kind of an eye-opening thing. And I was there studying culture um, as well. So, you know, to be able to see a culture that embraces it and is like pretty aware, like, yeah, of course, this is God's plan. Um, with stark contrast from what I'm used to uh, growing up here in the United States, where, you know, growing up, it's like, no, that's not cool. Right. Um, Corbett, you um, had mentioned... Um, like French history and hemp in French history. I wonder if you can touch on some of some of those key things from hemp in French history. Sure, it depends on how how long we want to want to take on it. It's a long history. <laughs> but I'll, I'll kind of give a, a precise uh, or uh, uh, history of it. But uh, you know, like uh, most places, it, it's 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 never it's never gone away. It, it was you know started back in the Neolithic age. The first signs in France uh, are from you know 270 BC. They found some hemp fibers and and, and seeds and all and. Uh, the 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 French have been working with it since since their since their culture begun. Uh, the French king Charlemagne he advocated its use in everyday life in eight 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 hundred A.D. Uh, they were using it for their food for their for their clothing. Uh, the uh, French were kind of in a good sort of geographical location where they were in Europe. They were able to bring down some of the genetics through some of the trade routes through Russia. 
they're uh, able to bring up some of the genetics from 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 Africa, from the South, and then they had the um, the 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 um, the Silk Road. Uh, the Persians were bringing uh, Asian genetics over into Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, uh, throughout the the uh, the Silk Road. Uh, that was kind of closed off in the 1450s, but then sort of in the sort of 14th through the 17th uh, centuries is, uh, is, is when you had the Italian and the French Renaissance. Hmm. Uh, and that was a really important time because um, uh, artists realized that um, uh, the artists before the Renaissance, they were painting on, on wood and they were painting on frescoes, uh, on, 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 on various um, uh, uh, poor sur surfaces. Uh, they hadn't invented canvas really yet. They were sort of the, 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 the wood boards that they were painting on would kind of warp in kind of the humid sort of uh, climates. Uh, and then the frescoes, you know, they were quite delicate. The artists found out that uh, the, the boat makers were using the, the hemp sails and the artists could realize that they would get all of the, uh, the, the off cuts. And the artists started painting on the, um, the, the hemp canvas that right. were, they were used to make the, the, the shipbuilders were using. And so they, um, the, when you sort of look back at uh, the, uh, the, the history and you look back at sort of uh, canvas, it actually goes back to the old French, the canivaux, mm -hmm. which is basically painting on hemp canvas. And so you look at some of your old masters from, you know, from your Michelangelo's up to your Van Gogh's, you know, a lot of those uh, uh, European painters were painting on hemp canvas. That's awesome. Uh, and so, you know, they were sort of uh, making it and all. And, and, and so, you know, all throughout the, 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 the Renaissance, uh, the, the, the ship, the, the builders are making using the ropes and the sails, the, the, the artists were painting on it. Uh, the peasants and the military were using it for their, for their clothing material. Um, and uh, where we get the seed sort of um, is in the where now where sort of we, where we work with the breeders is in the Loire Valley. Uh, and the Loire Valley has got quite a, a nice soil there. And that's a very old uh, place where they've been growing this hemp seed. And in fact, uh, the kind of Loire Valley, it, st it stretches from um, 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 from the coast up to um well, so wait, let me, so, so I think what you're saying is that hemp kind of facilitated the, uh, the Renaissance. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> that's what I'm understanding. Yeah, that's what I heard. <laughs> so hemp, it started with the, yes, it started that. All right. So here in the U.S., you know, we have, you know, the stigma, the marijuana stigma, right? And plus we have the CBD stigma too, but that's a different thing. In Europe, do they suffer from that same thing? It's like when you say hemp, do they say, oh, if you smoke your shirt, is it going to get you high? Or are they sort of like beyond that? I'm hoping they're beyond that. But tell me, is there a European stigma? Yeah, I would say it's there. Um, lesser so than, than here. More things are made of hemp in Europe than they are in America. So it might be easier for people to, to visualize that, you know. Um, I think they're probably about eight times larger than our market currently. And, you know, there's, uh, well, I, I think a great example, um, rolling tobacco is quite popular in Europe and it's very easy to find cigarette paper made out of hemp. Um, that's just a common thing there. And here in the States, rolling your own cigarette is not something you generally see. Um, so you know, if you just looked at that statistic alone, people would say, oh, this paper came from hemp. That's super cool. They might not ever think about it again after that, but, you know, they've seen it, right? We don't we don't have access to that here because it's not part of our culture. Right on. I, you reminded me, my friend AJ in college, he was the kind of guy who could roll a cigarette with one hand while driving. Yeah, Amazing. yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, that's that's interesting. Um, so let's get back to the U.S. Back to you mentioned the farm bill earlier. Um, are you either of you involved in you know like working with any of the associations in you know crafting language, or are you involved in any any of the policy making that's happening now? Um, so I'm quite close to D.C. I'm about an hour and a half, so it's a pretty quick jaunt for me to get up there. Um, I've had the the opportunity um, to go with uh, 
NHA and NIHC on different occasions um, to offer, you know, feedback on, uh, well, not feedback per se, but. So that's the National Hemp Association and the National. Industrial Hemp, Hemp Council. Industrial Hemp Council. Okay. Yep. Correct. Um, and so it was an opportunity to sit with, you know, uh, some of the decision and policymakers who, who work there and hear their feedback on what our industry might need and, you know, what are we as an industry advocating for um, in the new farm bill. Um, so, you know, those were great opportunities to, to, to go hear some good conversations and to offer, you know, my own perspective. Um, but there are other hemp associations or cannabis associations also adding language or trying to add language. It's not just fiber grain. There's cannabinoids also. Um, and those can muddy the water a bit since, you know, we're trying to get to fiber and grain exclusively. Uh, if you're also trying to have the same language regulate cannabinoids and all of the loopholes that potentially reside therein, yeah. um, it becomes a very uh, uh, muddy water quickly. Right. Now, this is probably an unpopular opinion that I hold, but I think hemp, industrial hemp, should mean fiber and grain, right? And all of the cannabinoid stuff should be cannabis, right? It should be medicinal cannabis, your CBD, your THC, all that stuff. And I just think it would be a nice, clean, clean way to, to split the two. But I know there's a lot of folks, you know, in the hemp industry that are focused on cannabinoid hemp, flower hemp, and uh, they're probably going to send me hate mail. I don't know. But uh, what sorts of things do you want to see in the 20... I was going to say 2023 farm bill, but let's be honest, that's not happening this year <laughs> with the state of our, our Congress right now. Uh, so maybe it's the 24 farm bill, maybe it's the 2025 farm bill, but like, what do you think is going to help the industry the most? Um, you know, I love the idea of the removal of FBI background checks. Um, I would love to see, you know, the licensing fee go away. It's, state to state um in virginia it's not an exorbitant cost but like in kansas it is an exorbitant cost um that that's a a limitation for certain um we're doing fiber and grain so the margins are already not nearly as thick as they are for cannabinoids and we're doing much larger acreage so if i'm getting testing costs for acreage or size this is a problem um, you know, that would be a, a nice uniform change to see. Um, you know, we work with OECD certified genetics out of Europe. So our our, our genetics we work with in the States are at 0.2% or less. Europe just moved that. We've, we're at 03 as well. We don't have a problem with those genetics. They're not going to go hot. Uh, however, they're northern varieties and they're not necessarily going to work in, say, Texas or Louisiana. And so the southern states, you know, they need a tropical variety. So they're looking at Chinese or Australian and those can go hot. Right. So. It's a it's a question of where are they growing that would necessitate an exemption. And I think in order to get the southern states really moving forward, um, you know, there needs to be some sort of solution for them to grow genetics that are going to work. Um, now that also opens up a bigger conversation right now, all the genetics in this country come from outside this country. And I think if the industry continues to grow the way we have, uh, there will be room for more and more domestic genetics here in the States. Um, there's only a couple of companies that are currently producing seed domestically in the U S. Um, but that will change in the next several years, there will be more options. So, you know, we could be looking at an exemption in the short term and some sort of longer term play where, you know, farmers know what they're buying, what they're putting in the ground. They know the morphology is going to be stable um, and they're going to get the same genetic year in and year out as we would with any other crop. Okay. What are your thoughts on a certified seed program here in the U S we like to work with certified seed. One of the reasons that uh, Conopy U S decided to work together 
uh, the companies that make up Conip US is because we all kind of believed in in having certified seed available. Uh, it makes sense when you sort of look at a business and you need to plan, you know, uh, you know, three, four, five years in advance. You need some genetics that you know you're going to get the same yield uh, each year. Uh, you, you need some genetics where you know that you're going to sort of have a benchmark that you have to meet for the, the germination. Uh, you know, it's got to be over sort of, uh, you know, 75%. But with our certified seed, you know, we like to get anywhere between 87 and 95% uh, germination. And with a certified seed, uh, you just have that. It's a little bit more controlled. Uh, and if something does happen, it's, it's all traceable. All of our seed comes in uh, seed lots uh, with numbers seed lot numbers. And so we're able to sort of trace it back. And if something does go wrong, you know, that seed is certified and we know the process of what farm it came from and how it was, uh, how it was cleaned and, and, and dried and bagged. And, and so we can look back at that. I was going to mention, um, you know, standards. Um, I think our industry will grow more quickly when we have standards for it. And that's not something we have a lot of right now because we've just started, um, you know, a standardized fiber grading system, a standardized herd grading system, um, you know, in order to hit the really big contracts that exist out there, you're going to have to produce the same material time in and time out. And, you know, it, it, it could be a certain spec of herd, shall we say, but it could be coming out of six different machines and therefore not the same standard. So, you know, with certified seed, there's some standardization, there's batch control, there's tracking. You have a very good idea of what it is you're going to get out of that, which means when I go to ASTM for some kind of certification on an end use material, when they trace my supply chain and my standard all the way back to the seed, I'm going to have that in place as well. I think, you know, for animal bedding, probably don't necessarily need a standardized seed. But if you're going for, say, you know, a feminine hygiene product or Kleenex with Kimberly Clark, you know, they're going to need an ASTM stamp on that. And you're going to have to be able to go all the way through the supply chain, all the way to the seed and where it comes from. So that makes me think that the manufacturers need to be talking directly with the folks who are developing the genetics. Is that right? Is that happening? It's, it's, it's something that we haven't really gotten in a lot of detail. I mentioned earlier that we work with a lot of universities and they've been trialing our seeds to figure out what grows where and what doesn't. And we've, we figured that out now. We know what genetics grow where and where they don't. And the next step is now is, is looking at the, 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 the details of, of the herd absorbency, uh, the fineness uh, and the softness of the, the, the hemp fibers. Uh, uh, and so, you know, each one of these varieties that I've been growing over the last few years is, you know, once that stalk grows, you know, you can snap it and you can do what we call kind of the wiggle test on the field. And you can see the difference in, in fiber qualities, you know, different hemp varieties have different, mm -hmm. Uh, different hemp varieties have different fiber qualities. And so that is, I think, going to eventually come to end use. I think there's some that's much more finer uh, than others that's better for other uses. And uh, and so I'm really kind of advocating now that uh, institutions really need to study the specifics and the details of the fibers. And they're starting to do that now. We're, we're doing some stuff with the University of, of Tennessee uh, I know that uh, uh, David Gang up at the University of Washington is looking at it. Uh, you know, that's something that's on the mind of, of Larry Smart at Cornell's. They know that different genetics have different fiber qualities. Right. And so we've got to kind of match that up with the industry, per se. Okay. I think that's what's coming next. Yeah. Robin, you want to add anything to that? You know, Corbett gave us a bit of a rundown on the history of hemp in France. But, you know, their, their co-op's been producing hemp for decades and, you know, their breeders and farmers and processors are all part of that co-op. And they have been talking about this. So um, I think that the, the ultimately everybody who has a piece or a stake in the supply chain is going to be having a conversation. We might not just be there yet in the States. Um, you know, I think the co-op model is a great model. I think it's got challenges, but I think it's got great benefits. 
Um, and that would have, you know, a farmer, a processor and the manufacturer all at the table together. And I think, frankly, that's going to have to happen in order to get the industry moving forward. If somebody does come forward and say, you know, I need 50,000 acres of hemp grown in this spec, we will certainly have processors and farmers and that manufacturer sitting down to discuss what that looks like. But um, there's not a lot of, of uh, shall we say, large buyers of this magnitude out there yet because, you know, hemp's just coming back. It's only been back a few years. Right, right. Um, is there sort of like a, a sector of the industry that that you think is going to like surprise people or, you know, like that isn't getting a lot of attention now that might sort of be a sleeper and come into something bigger later? From my perspective, um, I think that, well, I don't know if it's a secret. Uh, I'm a big fan of pulp. Um, and the advantages of, of hemp cellulose going into a multitude of different industries. It's obviously animal feed um, is, is one of those big pieces of that puzzle as well. But that's, you know, we've been working on that. We will continue to work on that. Right. Okay. Um, what else should listeners know about Kona P U.S.? I think that Kona P U.S., um, we have a selection of, of, of hemp seeds that are proven in the field. Um, and they're workable in the decorticators um, that have good fiber quality. Uh, the, the French know that they have something good, and we're lucky that, that, that we carry their seed in our catalog. And, uh, and I think that when people buy seeds from Konopi U.S., they know that they're just not buying a bag of seed. Uh, they're kind of buying, you know, decades of experience of all of our group. You know, we work together and, and, and we kind of, you know, we want this industry to kind of succeed as a whole. Uh, you know, I, I tell people that really of all the seed uh, dealers and distributors that I talk with, you know, I, I tell them that, look, I, you guys are selling seed and we're not in competition with one another because they say that we've got to plant millions of acres of this. And I work with the biggest seed breeder in the world and I know getting to a million or two million acres takes a lot of seed. And like right now we can't do it alone. And so it takes a, a whole industry to, to make this uh, uh, to succeed and uh, to, for us to all be successful. We kind of have to work together. And, you know, one of the things that I think that uh, when you uh, work with Konopi US, if, if, if you're growing in a location where we note our seed isn't going to grow, we'll, we'll tell you, you know, we like to be really honest. We like to bring some sort of integrity and, and truth to this industry because there's been a lot of um, uh, hype around it. Uh, and there's just been a lot of sort of kind of uh, false hope. And so we like to be kind of real uh, about it and uh, be honest with our clients. And, um, and if there's, you know, something uh, in a location that, that we, we can't um, fill, uh, fulfill your need, then you know we'll 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 you know give you some other directions to go uh, because again uh, we have to kind of succeed as, as 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 a whole industry just not as individuals. Amen to that. Yeah, um, Robin, you want to add anything to what folks should know or think of when they think of Konopi U.S.? Yeah, you know we have been working on the industry for a very short amount of time, um, and we need to to recognize we have a lot to learn still. Uh, nobody's got all the answers. We're going to learn so much new information in the next five years that I'm, I'm sure it'll make what we're doing now. We'll look back and say, well, what were we thinking? Right. That's just the nature of new information. Um, you know, so I think we're all out here doing the best with what we've got. And, you know, as Corbett mentioned, you know, we want everybody to succeed. And so we're very open with our information. Um, you know, we're, we try to do the right thing in every situation. Um, you know, it, it's all about communication. So we try to, to, to be as active as we can. Um, and a big part of that is, you know, farmers calling us on the phone saying, Hey, this is happening. That's happening. Um, you know, what do I do? How do I do it? As Corbett said, we'll try to go make visits as well. Um, you know, and just, to try to be a reliable business that people know, you know, if I get these genetics, um, you know, they're going to work. All right. Thank you for that. All right. Well, Corbett and Robin, it has been a pleasure talking to you guys today. So thank you so much for sharing your time with me. Um, Thanks for having us. Uh, 
Yeah, I will put a link to um, Konope US on the show page for this episode. And if there's anything else you want to send me that I can put there for our listeners to, to check out, uh, please do. And uh, otherwise, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll keep in touch. And uh, I look forward to watching you guys, you know, kill it. So congratulations. Thanks, Eric. We, awesome. uh, we look forward to your next episode. You do great work. Thank you. Glad to be part of it. Thank you. Thanks so much for having us, Eric. Much appreciated, my friend. All right. And just like that, the show comes to an end. Congratulations. We made it. Thank you for listening to today's show. My name is Eric Herlock. I'm the digital editor at Lancaster Farming Newspaper, the greatest agricultural newspaper in the world. Don't take my word for it, though. Check it out yourself. You won't be disappointed. You can get a subscription at LancasterFarming.com. You can also find the show page for this episode and click on the links, learn about Kona PUS, watch some videos, all that stuff. Okay? Okay. All right. If you have questions or comments or anything for me, you can always send an email to podcast at LancasterFarming.com and I will receive it, I will read it, I will answer it, and we'll go from there. All right, until next time, I will see you in the newspaper. Industrial Hemp. Season 3, Episode 41 of the Lancaster Farming Industrial Hemp Podcast is copyright 2023 by Lancaster Farming Newspaper, part of the Steinman Communications family. Today's show was written, recorded, edited, and produced by Eric Herlock. The music you hear throughout the show is courtesy of Tin Bird Shadow.